My name is Rooja. So we are a team of five people who have done this as a part of our academic project. Currently, I think all of us are working as designers someplace or the other. But uh, yeah, this was one of the passion projects that we completed during the last semester of our academics. Uh, the topic is more about biodiversity and how the conservation uh, and, and the negligence of biodiversity affects us. Yeah. Cool. So that's all right. It. And it's it's Rucha, right? Rucha, is that how you prefer? Yeah, yeah okay. that's me. Thanks. Thanks, Rucha Thank and team. Uh, Ananya, I think over to you for residue, residue and resource. Uh, hi, my name is Ananya and uh, I'm currently, uh, I've just finished my college. Again, I'm a designer and my project is about essentially how can we uh, reuse industrial waste uh, in an innovative manner to create more value out of it. Uh, and I could go more about it while I'm presenting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Locally grown, are you here? Yes. Um, my name is Sona Visser. I'm a PhD researcher, designer and lecturer at the University of the Arts London. <laughs> And uh, today I'm going to present to you my map locally grown, which was part of a residency at the Design Museum, which all, all looks at um, yeah, observations within a human hair recycling waste system. Thanks. Untwining choir? I'm not sure I'm um, pronouncing choir correctly. Hello, hi, I'm Rachel here. Uh, I'm an architect and a furniture designer, and I currently work in an export furniture house. Uh, so our topic is Untwining Koya, which is a project which is aiming to revitalize the Koya industry of Kerala. So you can hear more about it ahead. Next up, we have Unearthing Hidden Treasures. Uh, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Parvati, and uh, I'm a product design student from National Institute of Design, India. And me, along with my teammate, Bibin Babu, we work. Uh, on the project titled Unearthing Hidden Treasures, which, which is basically about understanding waste management in urban cities and uh, coming up with pathways for generating value from it. Yeah, thank you. Amazing, thanks so much. And Birger, are you uh, ready and comfortable with giving a few uh, comments and introduction about yourself? Yes, shall I say a little bit about myself? Mm -hmm. Please. Okay. Um, I'm... Um retired, first of all, <laughs> professor emeritus at the Oslo School of Architecture and Design. I started to work with systems-oriented design in 2005, six or something uh, with the Maria, amongst others, who is here. And since uh, that worked with this team and started the RSD conferences in 2012, and co-founded the um, SDA. Um, I appreciate how all of the projects, um, sort of uh, everybody presenting their projects sort of made it almost a teaser. It felt a little bit like maybe we're on a dating show or about to meet all these lovely guests. Um, so with that, let's uh, launch into the actual presentations. And again, five minutes, we're gonna try to keep it firm um, and let's circle back to the silent crisis. It started with trying to understand a few key concerns that we had, which is how and why are we neglecting the biodiversity? What is the price that we pay? What are the benefits that we reap while neglecting these biodiversity or the services provided by them and the following outcomes? So uh, broadly, we followed a, a process where we try to first identify the key concerns and understand more uh, deeply from secondary sources. Then uh, we try to map our own system and understand the dynamics of how each activity affects the other, the cause and effect system. Also, then we try to validate our assumptions that we did while uh, coming up with this system and understand the ground reality within India of how habitats and ec economy of a village or a particular area is uh, dependent on the different biodiversity. Then trying to identify what is the collective viewpoint that we want to share as a group and what do we want to say about it through the narrative and finally designing the map or the system. So uh, yeah, starting with you know uh, gathering evidences and understanding and following 
following a format of how we record these stories that come across in the news. And then this was the, the, the first most raw version of the map that we created where we mapped everything related to ecology, bi bi biodiversity and human activities uh, and how it affects or le leads to different phenomena. Um, yes, it was a messy process. So this is a picture of us working. And then, like we, uh, like I said, we tried to um, understand or validate our assumptions while creating this map through a series of few interviews with subject matter experts and field visits and yeah, different interviews. So yeah, in the process, we spoke to a few people from the government ministry, a few people who have pioneered and come up with very sustainable ways to um, run tribal economies that are de dependent on their biodiversity or the environment, I would say. Then also speaking to a few professors at different universities and a few yeah, tech experts as well. One um, institution that helped us in uh, organizing and facilitating our field visit was Foundation of Ecological Survey. Uh, they do really good work. So if you want to check them out. Uh, so this was one of the villages that we visited within India, where uh, a lot of their economy or professional activity throughout the year is dependent on silk worm and harvesting these cocoons from the silk worm. So we spoke a lot. We, uh, yeah, we tried to understand how their cycle uh, changes according to the season. And uh, yeah, after all of this research, we started identifying a few patterns. Uh, and then we tried to tag them to archetypes, for example, the tragedy of commons where, uh, so specifically in India right now, a lot of people from agriculture are tending towards commercial crops and that affects the soil or uh, the, the, yeah, the harvesting uh, situation of the place over time, over the years. This also leads to loss of the indigenous crops or the variety that was grown, the biodiversity that was grown and that indirectly leading to loss of culture and you know the uniqueness of the place so like that we identified different archetypes and then we tried to generate a few insights and then mapping the insights back to our original map to validate uh, if what we've understood is right or wrong and then we try to come up with a brief for ourselves of what we want to say via our uh, systems map which was uh, we want this map to help people or decision makers understand the cost of negligence development or conservation of biodiversity through various angles and then uh, we try to uh, uh, you know try different iterations on on the metaphors of how this map should look or how do we can communicate these interrelations that we came up with. Uh, so basically the main metaphor that we chose was a tree where uh, below the ground level, which is the root system, speaks more about the different services that biodiversity offers to us and how we intervene to basically convert their facilities or their offerings into services and above the ground line, which is the visible part, is the benefits that we reap the costs that come with these benefits and the entire canopy system in general. So uh, moving ahead, creating a layout or, or maybe if you can say a wireframe of how we wanted the entire narrative to flow. And uh, this is how our map uh, looks at the final stage where in the initial half, we are speaking about statistics, providing numbers of how serious or grave this concern of biodiversity loss is and how it has increased over the years. Then speaking about the different costs of neglecting that we are uh, addressing and also the entire system that we came up with, uh, the, the with, with the highlighted points being the umbrella themes and then fine tuning diff different subjects. Moving ahead, also highlighting the archetypes, the stakeholders, and then uh, uh, so we also felt that numbers do speak a lot, but empathy is generated through personal stories. So towards the end, we have added a small uh, case study of one of our field visits, the situation in a particular village and how it has affected uh, the biodiversity loss has affected their situ current situation. And then towards the okay. end, we've just given a few parts <laughs> ahead that can be taken up. 
well yeah, done, so, Rucha. I realized five minutes is not a lot of time, is it? <laughs> no, I had to rush a lot, no. but I think I was prepared. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. tough. Uh, you did great. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat about posting a link to the map itself, and I suspect we'll see it there in a moment, um, either from Cheryl or for yourself. But otherwise, I'm going to say thank you again to Rucha and team. We're going to shift you. on to the next team. And again, we'll be circling back for discussion at the end of the uh, rounds. Yeah. Okay. Thank so, you. next one. Thank you so much. Residue to resource. Yes, I'll just share my screen. Mm -hmm. I uh, hope it's visible in the presentation mode. You're good to go. Okay. Just, okay. Uh, so uh, the project, I'm just going to give a small background before I start. So as we all know, industrial activities adversely affect our environment. And however, they're very essential for the economic growth of the country. So to address the challenge, we need uh, uh, alternate industrial practices that are economically viable, but at the same time aid our environment. So this is also based on the study, which says that uh, with, uh, I mean, if you look at the history and all the industrial revolutions with each, uh, when the new sources of energy come and new manufacturing facilities or methods are being used, each country can achieve a, uh, achieve a certain amount of aggregate efficiency. And to go beyond that achieved number to maximize the sources of energy or the techniques of production or the raw materials need to be upgraded or changed in an efficient manner. So this was one of the primary uh, uh, basis of the project. Uh, so I start, I'm start. i just going to explain the whole process of research and the tools that we used uh, that I used to uh, come up with it, uh, come up with the final solution. So the mapping started with sustainable development goals 8, 11, and 12, which are uh, pertaining to material consumption, waste management, sustainable growth, economic productivity in labor intensive sectors and industrial innovation, et cetera. So, we, um, so after that, uh, through concept mapping, uh, I can zoom in a bit here. It was done in two higher, you can see two different colors of thread. So it's essentially in different hierarchies. So this helped, uh, helped the project uh, to focus on the idea of sustainable production and consumption because they had the highest number of linkages, suggesting that if that particular, particular area is intervened, it will uh, maximize the impact as compared to the other, uh, uh, area, uh, other areas of intervention. So correlating this to other background studies, uh, we uh, uh, came with a, came up with a list of determinants, uh, which affect the smaller subsystems in uh, in a micro level. So the determinants were classified into techniques, enablers, and drivers. So you can see here. So it was used to basically re uh, find out if the loops are reinforcing or not, and then this essentially helped to draw the analysis and inferences, and. Um, so the primary inferences and analysis suggested a lot about shortcomings in the industrial recycling, which is essentially downcycling of the material, and uh, a lot about the additional cost of circularity. So the final aim we came up to was to achieve a closed loop manufacturing in, in the Indian furniture sector. Focusing on the manufacture sector was uh, derived from the uh, idea of uh, the contribution it has in the country's GDP. And furniture, of, uh, we focused on it because uh, it was an academic project and we are furniture design students, so we thought it'd be interesting. So the um, objective is here, I can move that. Uh, so uh, we used how might be to find the areas of opportunity and narrowed it down into two, uh, to two, which is utilizing the manufacturing residue and optimizing additional cost per circular products. So um, the, Background study on furniture industry was done around uh, India's MSMEs only, which is micro, small, and medium enterprises. So the formulated research question was how the uh, dependency on virgin wood uh, and wood-based products in the home furniture segment can be reduced because uh, maximum amount of virgin wood goes into making particle boards, which is the maximum used amount in home furniture segment. Uh, this is coming from the uh, research. And uh, to achieve this, we were focusing on um, the uh, methods which were least uh, least impactful to achieve uh, circularity as per the butterfly diagram. 
um so the areas like marginal cost procurement procurement design and product life cycle wastage etc were explored to map out this uh, supply chain so this supply chain is essentially uh, based in a geographic location uh, uh, which was selected it's in amdabad in gujarat in the state of gujarat so uh, in the giga map so like i said the least impactful ways so reusing is one of uh, was the least impactful way to achieve uh, to intervene considering the increasing environmental impact and the additional cost of circularity that arises and for later reference the supply the complete supply chain is over here um this is a version of it and um, so through in the supply chain essentially after mapping we uh, found the primary stakeholders to be the furniture manufacturers manufacturers engineering wood manufacturers engineered wood and the raw material processing units which was a uh, uh, completely new insight for us so um it was uh, so that's essentially where the area of intervention lies these uh, processing raw material processing units work with various materials which is supplied to the these industries over here so essentially no, no, get you to clue up oh, okay <laughs> yeah, you can finish your thought for sure yeah okay i'll just can i finish this last part this is the last one please yeah yeah thanks uh, so the idea essentially was that we are utilizing a material which is already there in the supply chain uh, and the links also exist and this was a short uh, a mid term solution that can be achieved in 2 to 3 years as compared to uh, uh, the primary the first idea was to use wood based but since it has a poor recovery chain that was ruled out and these are some of the material explorations that we did and this was the final outcome which is uh, a resin which is made from uh, docs that is the oil cakes uh, which is used at the moment in the supply chain but for uh, but for functions that are not as efficient as it could be considering it's a raw material hmm. amazing that, that's mm -hmm. thanks so much okay thank you let's keep it going thank you so much next up again we've got locally grown so sunny we can see your screen we got um you know the full window i don't know if you want to switch it over it's a, it's perfectly legible but yeah awesome oh well, sorry apologize for that that's no, okay no problem that, no apologies that, necessary take an hour can Looks you see me perfect mm -hmm. great thank you so much hello everyone my name is sana i am um researcher at the university of the arts london and i'm excited uh, to present to you my map locally grown mapping the spaces uh, between the elements of a hyperlocal human hair waste ecosystem to give you some background as this is a fairly niche topic and some of you might not know much about it um there is around 6.8 million kilograms of human hair waste each year in the uk alone which uh, ends up in landfill releasing toxic gases um this abundant yet locally grown resource has many valuable characteristics it is lightweight biodegradable extremely strong and a good insulator since 2016 i have investigated the potential of human hair for circular and regenerative material materials and products including yarn as pictured here and rope resulting into a range of products from bags to belts to textiles by plastics and many more things which i won't delve into too much the context for the map I'm presented today was part of my 12 month residency at the Design Museum as part of the Future Observatory program funded by AHRC. The goal of the residency was to actively engage with the main stakeholders in the system, the hairdressers and barbers, to rethink, reimagine, and redesign the system of hair recycling for regenerative futures. The mapping was one of the methods I used in the project alongside other participatory and systemic design approaches, including dialogue with stakeholders and ethnography. The purpose of the map was to highlight observations of a small scale hair collection and recycling process with the aim to identify the key leverage points for systemic design intervention. My intention was to engage with hairdressers to collect hair, observe and analyze the processes both within and outside the salons and shops. I first mapped the 97 hairdressers in one mile radius 
of the design museum which of which eight hairdressers were able to participate to donate hair and engage in the project throughout the desk research and conversations i did find out that the hairdressing sector in the uk is quite a vulnerable sector um, as it's one of the lowest paid jobs predominantly part-time majority female um, and self-employed which make me think how would the future look like if hair becomes a valuable material resource and what is the role they play in this what in essence if our farmers if our hairdressers become the farmers of the future as part of the process i collected data and insights of the materials as well as conversations um, in a total of four months i collected um, 76 kilograms of hair from eight salons and this is an image of the workspace in the museum um, one of the key barriers um, was the contamination of hair with dust as well as other uh, as well as being, being mixed together, which makes it more difficult for the hair recycling itself. The following slides give you a bit of an insight into the conversation and observations with the hairdressers and barbers. Um, these are some stills uh, as part of a film I made together with Ellis Dusova. Some of these conversations highlighted very relevant issues from um, ranging from limited resources to like space and time to monetary rewards uh, and communication barriers. Um, here's some more slides. Um, these were then dotted on this census map as a sense making exercise. The design of the map was based around the framework of a life cycle map, which generally looks a bit more like this on the left. On the right, you'll see a basic overview of hair's potential life cycle. However, the focus was intended on the processes before, um, on the process before the actual processing of the hair itself. So on this part of the life cycle. Um, which later down the line was expanded into this to then this as a final map. To take a closer look, the details highlight quite mundane yet extremely relevant observations. For example, that hairdressers and barbers use similar key tools, however, operate slightly differently in terms of time and price. Um, there are also very interesting observations in the collection and donating parts. For example, a feeling of FOMO, fear of missing out from others that didn't participate when was walking with larger bags of hair past their shop. Or a barber shop, for example, generates six times more uh, waste than one hairdresser. Um, also, the idea that they can save money from um, uh, actually sending their waste to the council uh, also was raised. This led me to identifying the key barriers which could be turned into opportunities in relation to the contamination and sorting issues. The idea was to, how can we intervene at the salons rather than proposing interventions for the sorting of the hair at the latest stage in the life cycle? Um, I therefore focused on the redesign of tools within the salon, including the gown. So this will be part of the map and you can, I'm sure, look and read into it more later. This was um, led to the redesigning of the bin and the redesigning of a barber's chair that can collect hair as it's being cut. So the next steps involved the designing of the tools whilst in conversation with the stakeholders to make sure it aligned with their needs. And these are the final prototypes, including a chair and the bin and the trolley. So here are the final limitations, findings and recommendations, but I'm aware that we're running out of time, so you can have a read here. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. I'm most impressed perhaps that you managed to avoid making any puns about entanglement, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's so tempting. Thanks so much, Sunny. Thank you. Okay, let's shift again to Untwining a Choir. Good evening, everyone. I'm just sharing the screen. Mm -hmm. Is it visible now? Yeah, I'm seeing you. Yeah, it's good to go. Yeah, so our topic on twining choir, understanding the choir industries in Kerala. So, yeah. So the SDG goal that we focused on is uh, nine, which is industry innovation and infrastructure. 
um, and we focused in Kerala because Kerala is one was the gateway states of India, which had a, was a lot of culturally rich and um, historically important. So one of our uh, main uh, key points of Kerala is as a state is tradition, culture, uh, health uh, facilities, education, tourism, unique ecology and biodiversity. And Kerala is also the uh, leading, has a number one rank in HDI rank and a state startup rank in two. But employment rate compared to the national average is 10.1% and ease of doing business rank is just 15 out of 36. And one, some of the initial triggers uh, during our studies was how why industrialists in uh, Kerala were moving out. A lot of them were moving to the neighboring states and some even uh, uh, did suicides because the government was not supportive and the officials were creating a lot of troubles. Even the attitude of uh, people of Kerala are uh, not very uh, industrial friendly, like a lot of hierarchy and power groups, crab mentalities, a lot of uh, strikes for not just for rights, for, but for better quality of life. And uh, Kerala is a, a consumer state and a lot of uh, brotherhood amongst the laborers, which makes it even more difficult for the industrialists. And so which uh, led to our initial research questions, why is Kerala not industrial friendly and which industries have a uh, local material support and why are the in uh, industries in Kerala are moving out and why is the coir industry in Kerala declining? Oh. And some of the further challenges in the manufacturing sector was uh, uh, the lay of the land, which is Kerala is a very narrow state with the uh, Western Ghats on one side, which reduces the top uh, the plain land area, uh, which is suitable for developing uh, factories. And also there's no good infrastructure facilities for MSMEs and weak forward and backward linkages. Uh, the traditional industries in Kerala are mainly classified under the heads of the handicraft industry, bamboo, textile, khadi, and the coir industry. Uh, coir has also been uh, one of the oldest industries in the state and is also the largest uh, employment generator in the state as well. However, uh, recently there have been many reports in the state uh, uh, which shows that the coir industry has been in a decline. Uh, that is due to multiple states, including socioeconomic uh, problems, political problems, and uh, uniquely to the state of Kerala, geographical reasons. And Kerala has historically had the highest producer of coconut, but uh, over the past decade, it has been seen that this has been in a decline, as well as the land use for coconut production has also been in decline in comparison to the uh, competing states, where the cultivation has been increasing due to uh, the application of modern techniques and better uh, varieties of coconuts. So uh, coming to the fact that uh, coconut has not been classified as a plantation crop resulted in the Land Sealing Act, uh, which resulted in fragmentation of coconut groves in uh, Kerala, which resulted in uh, lower production of coconut, which affected the coir industry. One can notice that the land use pattern in Kerala, the cultivated land accounts 52.4 percent. Still, the uh, and the major crop farmed is coconut, yet it has not been cl uh, classified as a plantation crop, which uh, in uh, affects the production of coconuts in the coir uh, industry. Uh, so mainly the raw materials that you get from coconut is uh, brown fiber and white fiber and cocopic blocks. A big flow in India's coconut and coir industry is evident from the export market. And of all the export, we can see that close to 70% is actually coir and coir fiber, which are just untreated raw materials. And there is no value addition in this sector. And we can also see that uh, while husky utilization in, the, in India is 40%, which is not very commendable, Kerala's is much lower at just 14.8%. And these are some of the key products. We can see that the diversification of products here is very limited. Uh, we started our case studies by initially mapping out all the uh, major stakeholders involved and identifying the um, stakeholders from the lowest cooperative sectors, uh, cooperative societies to the largest uh, governing bodies and factories. Uh, so the Kerala government started a scheme called the second reorganization of coir sector that was basically to identify ways to um, provide social protection and institutional support for R&D, new defibring units. and uh, But uh, all these systems have been remained as theories and nothing has become concrete. Uh, and even one of the uh, major problems with this is that they haven't identified the major issues with the sector that is actually house procurement system and the uh, marketing of the uh, products. 
and if we take just the co cooperatives for example we can see that of the major uh, of all the cooperative societies available only 235 are still functioning while the rest are either functioning at a loss or are completely defunct and of all these of the thousand societies there is just one society that is dedicated to collecting foia and uh, the problems in the industry are mainly transportation uh, middlemen investment of agents uh, substituted goods and market fluctuation rates so the finally the major gaps we identified are high wages uh, long periods of setting up factories no organized collection system no value addition and product diversification and um, lack of sufficient support from officials so the these were... uh, we identified major problems uh, the causes of these problems and the consequences and we were able to shortlist down to just three problems where we are intervening and providing solutions uh the uh, our solutions are classified into hard intervention soft intervention and long term interventions uh, where the hard intervention focuses on tackling the problem of hard collection system and the soft intervention focuses on the fact that there is no uh, useful marketing strategy within the state for the coir industry and the third intervention focuses on the idea that coir has a potential to become a replacement for uh, hard boards such as plywood and particle board so i'm going to ask you guys to clue up here too Yeah, uh, Rachel, you can just move to the. You have like fifteen seconds. Yeah. yeah, just uh, coming to the Giga Map. Uh, so our intent intention of uh, our soft intervention was Ara, which is a public private enterprise which focuses on acting as a plug in for the uh, existing system in place. So all the in the map, all the gray. Uh, 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 paths that you can see are existing frameworks, and our yellow uh, colored ones are the uh, plugins that we've proposed. So Ara acts as a connector between uh, the existing systems in place, where we bring in a, a design team, a training team, uh, and even uh, we set up a coir wood factory unit. Like how uh, Ananya had mentioned, particle board is one of the uh, resource that uses virgin wood. So in replacement of that, coir pith could be utilized to make uh, cocoa wood. So all of this uh, can be utilized to uh, integrate the system into a better framework and finally even the marketing uh, plugin could be brought in and we can have uh, on this platform of ara uh, uh, online store as well as physical show, uh, showrooms which will uh, sell uh, coir products as well as gi products of kerala and in the long term uh, intervention uh, this was a small experiment that we did uh, with the coir cocopith using a natural uh, resin unlike the current uh, coir uh, boards that they use formaldehyde uh, which is not eco friendly so these were our two main interventions and we've also mapped all the sta new stakeholders coming into the system Wonderful. yeah thanks team awesome thanks so much okay last but not least unearthing hidden treasures yeah i'll just share my screen Yeah. Uh is my screen visible? Good to go. Yeah. So um uh, so we me and my teammate Bibin we worked uh, on the topic of unearthing hidden treasures which is basically on waste management in urban cities. So to give a sort of uh, prelude on what it was and why it triggered what was the trigger for us to take up this topic was uh, last year around this time there was a pretty sensational news that was happening in india wherein in the city of kochi uh, which is uh, located in the south indian state of kerala there is a landfill famous one which is called as brahmapuram so it caught fire and um, landfill fires are not exactly an uncommon thing but this time what happened was uh, it got pretty much out of control um and even though the administrators and the workers there tried to uh, actually put it through conceal it from the people what happened was that it was not under control so soon enough within hours the whole city went under the smoke uh, people started falling sick and uh, this almost went on till almost like one week under which this whole city was in sort of like a fire fighting mode so that was the initial trigger for us in addition to waste being such an omnipresent topic so then what we tried to do was we tried to find parallels to the study area that we were doing our project in which was in amdabad where our college was situated and um, not so surprisingly enough we found a landfill there as well bigger than this one and uh, 
So um, we went there and it was sort of a realization we, when we understood that the landfill is sort of the end result of something that we individually contribute to. That is like not being so conscious about our waste generation or the disposal. So um, then initially we started off doing a primary mapping so that we could put down what we know about this topic because obviously we have a lot of biased and biased opinions about what the system is. And uh, then we try to understand what is the metrics of influence in this particular system, who are the stakeholders, how much influence they have on different things that happen in the system. Um, and then we try to also map down what the existing systems are, not just in Ahmedabad, which was our study area, but also throughout India. What are the like good system, whether it's like landfill, decentralized models of waste management and things like that. Um, and uh, then uh, the important part was we tried to map out case studies as well, not just from India, from outside India as well, to understand what are the different strategies or inter interventions implemented by people, societies, communities. Um, uh, so yeah, even studios who are doing incredible work with uh, taking waste and converting it into something that is so useful. And then we went on to do field visits because that was also another important part. And so we went to like private organizations who were involved in waste collection, waste collection, who were hiring waste collectors. And uh, uh, yeah, so the thing was none of these organizations, these private organizations were standing as an isolated waste management facility, but they were also doing things like empowering the waste collectors, for example, giving education to their children or even like offering them glass every day before they go to work. Uh, so another important part about this was that when we went, enduring factor about the whole uh, field visit was when we went to interact with these people, they were really happy because they also felt like, okay, we are being interested in their work and they were that was also giving that their work matters. Then th these are some of the pics from when we visited Burana Landfill, uh, which is in Ahmedabad. And so a biomining project was happening there. Um, and then these are a few other pictures from when we went on a day for waste collection with these waste collectors so that we could see how the people are interacting with them, how they are interacting. And this is the whole thing. We try to understand how they segregate, what the different types of waste that come to them and how actually households dispose their waste, which is some, sometimes the, when we are with them, we sort of understand what amount of great work that they are actually doing. Um, yeah, then we went on to visit few factories that are involved in making uh, waste uh, plastic products and also some really cool uh, retail outlets that uh, recycle used goods like uh, old uh, gaming CDs and things like that that would otherwise end up with the waste. Then interaction with uh, subject experts, academicians. Um, and then from this information, we sort of made like a secondary mapping so that we could kind of deepen and put it down because at this point it was starting to slowly get overwhelming, the information that we were getting. And this was a subtopic. So another subtopic that we came to was how value can be generated from this discarded. And it is not just limited to products. We realized, we realized that um, around waste, even services and infrastructure can be created that can generate value. Uh, and then we tried to put all of them down into how might we so that it is easier for us to ideate as well as by this time we were getting pretty much saturated. So we decided to call in our, colleague, our colleagues, our fellow classmates and even students from management, urban planning. And we all sat together, made this workshop and it was really interesting how different sets of people have different perspectives to the same problem. Um, then from the insights and from the ideas we got, we tried to put them down together and try to bubble different, solu try to put different solutions into similar bubbles. Um, yeah, and also putting them like, what can be done in the near future, in the late future, and things like that. So this was the final mapping. So we kind of came up to three different uh, solution systems. And uh, so one of our main solution system involved around, for example, involved around a waste collector's card. So for waste collectors, a card, a uniform is not exactly what we feel towards it. For them, it is a sort of a thing that gives them identity, power, authority. So they, we sort of uh, gave the proposal for a waste collector's card, which gives them like social security benefits, health benefits, and things like that. Um, and then coming on to GigaMap and the concept behind why we used specifically diamonds. Uh, so there is this quote, as you can see, rescuing diamonds from the, uh, from the rough, which basically means that when you get diamond mined, initially it is just any ordinary stone. It's not even that shining, but 
it takes a skilled craftsman to actually polish it cut it and work on it uh, which results in what we know as the invaluable like diamond uh, so we thought of we sort of put the same concept to waste where like initially when we get waste it is sort of invaluable but we as creators designers or engineers we are the skilled craftsmen that can turn it into something of value so this were like a few back uh, end process that were happening when we were making the RFA, final we up. yeah yeah so this was the rough sketch that we made and uh, this was our final giga map so in addition to this being the whole diamond thing this was also how our thought process was going so initially we were like completely out there and then slowly we were starting to figure out what the system is the lines becoming a bit more clearer so yeah that was the <laughs> rough spin end of giga map thank you thank you amazing thanks so much it really is a challenge getting the, through this stuff in five minutes so i appreciate everybody for for putting the hustle on dr savaldson yes do you have comments to share yeah um i before i just ask questions but i think we don't have time for answers maybe so mm -hmm. so i'm just going through my comments and um and um, try to say something sensible. Um, starting from the beginning with Ritsha, um, just give him a moment. I have to just check a little bit here. Um, yeah, you were, I, I really love this very big causal loop diagram that you made. Uh, I would have liked to see um more zoomed in and maybe a so so to some details. Um I love this that you were mapping back that you were sort of back checking your interventions or, or your ideas back to the map. Very good. And your final giga map is you you state that it was for communication. I must say there are always these beautiful maps from India which are amazing and uh I think um, Praveen called them metaphor maps once. And uh, it's, it seems to me that several of you also have been searching for a, a suitable metaphor to, to make these maps communication devices. Um, oh, the, the dog is coming. I don't know if you hear it. <laughs> um, yeah, I heard it. <laughs> OK, so. For several of the um, projects here, I saw this divide between the giga mapping and the process. For example, um, for Ananya, um, I think I was missing a little bit um, of looking at the mapping more in process in the process, such as the last. The last um, Parvati um, project, where they demonstrated maps, like a whole range of maps, the primary map, which indicates sort of an early stage um, understanding of the systems in play, uh, and even an existing system, I'm trying to map out the existing system. And what I loved was like case study mapping. Um, and also mapping out this nice field work um, and was secondary map mapping, I think it says, and then I, I can't read my own writing. Secondary mapping and ide ideation map and opportunity map. And then in the end, it's all um, collected this metaphor map again, which is obviously more about communication than about the process. But I, in that project, I really love this kind of um, um, different that mapping and, uh, and the systems understanding, which is implicit with mapping. I mean, mapping means to try to understand systems. And that, that, that was um, implemented throughout the whole process, which was really nice. Um, Rachel's project. Um, to be a bit, little bit critical also, <laughs> not only friendly or, or not only praising stuff here. Uh, you made a, a, a really nice gigamap, but the process was at, at least as it was presented, 
it was a lot of data and it was present very fragmented and like it could be any kind of business presentation of of um, of data and facts etc so what i was missing there was if you could integrate this all this data in in a gigamap and show how this actually plays out in the different parts of the system but then you did something very nice in your gigamap where you um where you show this kind of um orchestra of interventions and how they were linked and and that i mean i, I we, we 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 repeat and repeat that there's not very rarely there's or never there is just one brilliant idea but there must be not so brilliant ideas but they are orchestrated and they work together in the system and and how they are related to the system to the existing system is very central um i love the hair project and i missed one level there which is uh, was a cultural level i thought immediately because you you might have at least i have this kind of uh, cultural reaction to wearing a sweater are made out of human hair it suddenly gets sort of uh, <laughs> i'm not sure i want that so but this is a very interesting aspect of your project in a way so i think uh, if you want to add to the complexity um uh, you could add this kind of cultural considerations um i i like that you had a lot of uh, quite a good um anchoring of your reflections in systemic design and in systems thinking references and um okay i've thought through your map you had some wavy lines in the map which i didn't quite um read but everything went very fast so maybe you you probably have a very good explanation because i couldn't read them as relational lines or lines that connected things but more like Maybe it was sort of boundary lines or something. It was very interesting, at least. So I was wondering about that. Um, I love this aspect of um, you collected material and conversations and hand in hand. It's very nice. Um, OK. Uh, we still have a few minutes. Just checking my notes. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you for very brilliant um, presentations. Um, sometimes I think you were a bit too much caught up with um, and the, with communicating your project rather than this mapping and the system thinking through mapping. Just to say, this is Mapping Monday, so in some cases i was um, i would have loved to hear more um about your process about the mapping itself why you did choose this type of mapping at that stage of the process etc but thank you very much for a nice presentations i'm sure i have forgotten something but um, that's it Thank you, Birger. It's funny, you know, the presenters had a tough job, but you had to listen really close to every single one of those five minute uh, presentations and capture something to say. So also a very challenging job. Appreciate it. There is a uh, space, of course, for conversation now. If folks have questions uh, or uh, comments, they can raise their hand. We'll call on you to present here uh, to, or to share it on your mic, or you can ask in the chat. I can read things out loud. Is there something in the chat we should? I haven't seen a question. No, um, I mean, it's it's not possible to follow both. <laughs> mm -hmm. One thing, maybe Birger, um, I think your comments about trying to sort of present all the methods and data um, were sage. It's like so tough, right? You want to present uh, as much information about your process as possible so that you'll be perceived as valid. And at the same time, you want to get to the stuff. Do you, in your experience, have you seen sort of a best way to present? Have you ever seen, for instance, somebody presented in reverse, the map first and then methods afterwards or something like that? 
Um, yes, I've seen that, of course. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, this is very particular. It's about you. You have very. I, I know it's. It must be impossible, sort of, to to do this in five minutes. Um, you have very complex projects, and with particular thematics and fields, and you want to tell us all the work you did and all the people you talked to, and uh, in addition to show the maps. But uh, I think in general, a general thing is to always think about what the, what is this, what is the event asking for. Um, so I think, um, I mean. People are here for hearing about your mapping, sort of. So uh, that's the only advice I could give, which is only applicable to this event. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, valid. Thank you. But, but maybe something. I think the there's a much there's a much uh, much attention to to mapping, and uh, I think um, if we avoid just mapping, but doing for if you're very precise about how we do it and why we do it and when we do it. Okay, I, I, I remember one comment I had for, I mean, it's for all of, all of you maybe. Um, somebody of you said, I think it was the first project, said that um, um, it the process became very messy. Who, who said that? That's, okay, doesn't matter who said it, but... Uh, this is very important because when you work with uh, very complex uh, systems and and do systems systemic design with very complex systems, it can't avoid getting messy. You, you cannot have very orderly processes because this the mess is sort of part of the reality and this um, inflicts on you. So in a way, and then you make a very nice map that uh, that's sort of, communicates that you are you are I think it was the first presentation had very clear intentions of how and to whom to communicate and um, there's sort of this kind of tension between communicating clearly and having this messy process and to what degree do you would you like this messy process to shine through to the gigamap can the gigamap be a false? Um, impression if it's very orderly. So just one thought here. I think that was maybe I think that was Ucha, but I think it was for, it's not only for that project. I really love that mm -hmm. moment when you said it, it became very messy. <laughs> I would be very, very worried if it wasn't. <laughs> Okay. Mm -hmm. There were there was a question in the chat from Chris Herman. Um, were there any surprises for the presenters that showed up during your mapping, and what were they? So presenters, feel free to hop on your mic and comment. Did you encounter any surprises? No surprises. That's convenient. I mean, that's kind of what that's, you want. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Andre. <laughs> I can yeah, um, share I... one of them. <laughs> oh, sorry. You can go ahead after you. No, no, please answer. You should answer the question. Um, okay. Uh, I'd already written in the chat box. So basically, uh, when I was mapping the whole supply chain, there were um, Certain usually we get an eye to see large scale industries uh, and how they process the raw material and how the supply chain is. But then, uh, since you were looking at uh, MSMEs that are micro and small scale industries, there were a lot of these uh, uh, small, extremely small industries who contribute a lot in the supply chain and processing raw materials. And for me, it was a big surprise because we didn't know these third parties existed and had a contribution in bringing the raw material into the industrial areas and sectors. That is, that is it. Thank you. Uh, 
Andre. Okay, sure. I can resume. Um, this is uh, building a little bit on what Rosie just commented, but uh, I think uh, when it comes to you know presenting these maps and maybe the frustration that you had at the all the process behind this, like being um, presented first, I think the issue is that uh, usually you don't present these maps because uh, it's not so often useful to anyone except for the ones who are in within the process of making the maps. And that's kind of related to Rosie in the sense that, you know, how do you fit this in something that you present to someone in the formats of how presentations are done, you know, uh, with the slides and, the, you know, linear order of like how we present things. It's like it kind of doesn't fit the format of presenting in the conventional sense. Or if you were to present this in a conference that wouldn't be a design academic conference, but say public sector, I wouldn't know how you should present this in like a way that you could get engagement except for like interacting with it. But where would you have the space to do that? Kind of just throwing up a little bit of dilemmas here. Mm. Not dilemmas, um, but that, Yeah. Um, some people, when, when, when you're as a stranger, you don't know the project you're not a co-owner of the map and you you look at such a map like they we seen today which are meant to communicate and some people then say it's so much it takes so long time to understand i have to stand here in half an hour uh, to try to understand it and um, this was something we discussed in our group and this um streetwise consultants um andreas is my colleague who had done a lot of giga mapping workshops with a lot of different people, leaders, etc. And they said, okay, would you rather prefer a, a 50 to 100 page um, report? How long does it take to read that report? Because this map is, tells you all this much more efficient. This is what we forget. So um, I think these maps are highly efficient communication tools, but sometimes <clears throat> you maybe want to facilitate the reading just take people through it. And sometimes you have seen that uh, that some people have um, added some a layer of orientation to the map. So how to where to start and how to meander through the map to to uh, read it or to explore it in a, in a, in in the best way possible. But don't forget that they, these maps often felt so much that would take pages and pages and hours of hours reading if you if it would, would be in a different format and it would be very boring as, uh, also in addition <laughs> okay it was a wonderful conversation perhaps it's uh, an opportunity now that we've reached an, a natural stop to uh, close it out Thanks again, everybody, for attending. Thanks to all the presenters for packing in your work um, into that five-minute uh, timing. Thanks, Dr. Smaltzen, for the commentary and uh, advice. Um, and thanks to the audience, of course, for for attending um, and uh, being so engaged. And, you know, by all means, I know there's a lot of detail here, so make sure you look up the links that were shared in the chat. Um, be able to dive in deeper into whatever your projects, uh, whatever projects you want to read more about. Um, and a final thank you to Cheryl again for stitching this um, series together. And next week is Unmapping, I believe. Is it next week, Cheryl? Yes. <laughs>